weren't very easy on that one. We seem to that seemed to flow very, very well. Right. We we are recording. It's seven forty-four, and we might be expecting one or two other people, but we'll leave it as there is. Right. First of all, Anne, any news on the archaeological front? Not at all. Oh, sorry. Okay, that's that's uh, that's an that's an okay start. So let's let's see who's next. Right, Andy, um, you can't you you. Um, but Peter's trying to find your meeting. What? What does that mean? Right, Andy, keep um, talk to us. No, I haven't got any news at all. I'm afraid. Well, this is this is this is not good. This is no, not good. No, nothing even exciting's happened this week. I don't think. Right. Okay. On that case, I've got to warn Drina in advance. Drina, you've got a couple <laughs> of seconds to make something up. Right, um, David. Any any news from you this week? Uh, there have been a couple of reports from Zambia that they found wooden timbers worked with wooden timbers. They reckon it's forty thousand years old. Got a and, and and actually 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 weird, weirdly enough, David, we, that is one of the stories we're doing today, and it's uh, we, we've got uh, the, the the news about that is it's a little bit more older than that, David. Right. You are right; it's been all over the news. Apparently, it's it, if you've missed it, then you haven't been watching the news. It has been all over the news, so that we're, that's that's one of the things we're going to be doing. Right, Karina, uh, as you as you can work out, I'm fiddling with a few things in the background, trying to work out Peter and stuff. So you've got you've got to tell us something. OK, um, according to the news, there's new images of a 5000 year old Highland burial site, Scotland's longest chamber cairn burial site has been the scene of recent activity. Con Glass near Inverness is believed to be 5000 years old and new images have been taken. Gorse, oh, this is really interesting. Gorse bushes that obscured the chambered cairn have all, also been removed. That's it, I think. Do you, know, do you know what, right? I don't like that idea of gorse bushes being removed because I like gorse bushes. They're, they're, they're bushes of the fairy folk. And, and, and also, do you know what also likes I've got, I've gorse bushes? Ants. Ants love gorse bushes. So, um, ants. Ants. Yeah. It ba basically <laughs> the, poll uh, the pollination to do with um, ants. Um, and the, the, the pollination on gorse bushes, because they're usually flower at strange times of year when there's no bees around, the ants do it. Uh. So, you usually find loads of ants associated with gorse bushes. And one of, one, one of our main sellers is actually um, um, gorse flowers. And actually, I've got something very special to show you that is actually linked with gorse in a few moments. So that, that, was, that was actually quite a good, good thing that you mentioned there. Thank you very much. Right. Okay. Why do they, they have, cool. like, I don't know what they call them, like gorse bashing sessions, don't they? To bash the gorse away. Is that Do they? Thing? I don't We're, know. We are bracken bashing here. Oh, it's bracken, is it? That yeah. um, it's not I it's don't... not gorse. It, no, gorse. you wouldn't do that with gorse, lovely. You'd lose <laughs> you'd lose an arm. Mm. Okay. Uh, they're look. they're very spiky. Gorse gorse is yeah. actually I, I'm 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 really intrigued why you meant it's almost as if we're you're in league with the devil this week and, <laughs> and you you've actually the first image that we actually look at is to do with gorse, which is very odd. And it's actually, yeah. So, so I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to show you that now. I, what I'm doing is I'm just doing my last thing online, getting this ready, and oh. we've. Why? Why would they take the gorse away? I mean, it said it was hiding something. Why do they take bracken away? Does that just the, take? That's everything. The, the, th the thing is, the thing is, if you take the thing is, I'm a bit worried about that. I need to get the context. If you start taking plants away, then the, the delicate bio uh, flora of the landscape is is affected, which may have actually been protecting a tomb in the first place. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, we we are we are we are everything's flowing nicely. That's good. Uh, what what do I do with peak now? It's just oh god, I hate this. When uh, hang on a minute, it's just 
right? He's saying, trying, yes, join us. Um, have you got um, all access details? Right. Uh, I got I got a crack on. This is ridiculous. Right. OK. Right. So we, we are we are on to it. There are a few people online. Just a few things I want to mention as well. So obviously Margaret's not joining us this week. Adam's not joining us. And I don't know. Obviously, you know about the other Peter. I'd like to mention that we 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 we've got something on the Sunday that might interest you guys. It's a bit of a spoof archaeology history thing that looks at different issues that I do on a Sunday on YouTube at eight o'clock, and anyone can join that. So today I, I've got a I, I've got I've got a little bit of a list. We we go to South Africa, we go to Zambia. That's David's thing. We go to Pompeii, we go to Southern England and a sword. We go to Spain. We we also go to Stonehenge and we look at a couple of other things. And a quote from Neil Oliver. Neil Oliver said, um, mm. um, history repeats itself. And if anyone watches Neil Oliver, it's controversial st stuff. You'll know exactly what I mean. Right. So you you we go. And let's go with this. Let's learn from history. And... And somebody said, who's that woman? And, and yeah, I don't know if I've shown you this before, right? This itself is actually dated from the 1840s, the main bit of it. And this is one of the only surviving gorse grinding machines on the planet. And it, it's, it's about 50 metres away from me where I am. We, we actually own this gorse machine. It, it's it's a it's a gorse grinder, and uh, that there, those are the cutting blades. So you spin this around, and it cuts the gorse, right? And basically, what it is, oh, you can see the gorse behind as well, which is there it is. Uh, the one thing about this machine is is that in the eighteen forties, eighteen fifties, and eighteen sixties, particularly in the eighteen sixties, when there was a war, uh, when the American Civil War was on. That sort of affected everything in Britain from 1861 to 1865. People that had lots of gorse growing uh, would would cut the gorse up and use it for bedding, which which basically you get the really soft new growth of gorse, and you you use this machine and you use it for bedding instead of hay and straw, which may have been been in short supply in parts of Wales and. Um, northern england and scotland so there you go and this is why trina i said um it's a big shame that they're they're, they're getting rid of the gorse so gorse is very very important so how she knew that i don't know right so what we are going to do we've got the articles that we're, we're looking at and these articles themselves will will take us to loads of different parts of the world as you well know already because i've already told you and naturally, if anyone wants to ask about this gorse machine, if they want to do so now, if not, we'll do it when we've got questions. So it seemed it seemed very much to me that we've we've lost um, we've lost a few weeks in regards to archaeological news. Uh, so what I've got instead of me fiddling about with the computer and this and things printed out and bits of paper and stuff, I've decided to put the news items on and I'll just paraphrase what the text says on the screen. And I've also, interestingly enough, if those of you are interested in Pompeii, Henry, who's actually just come back from Pompeii, he's actually got some photographs that he sent me of Pompeii as he saw it just a few weeks ago, which I think would be interesting for some of you as well. So we've got really early prehistory. We've got all the way through. So that's great. So our, this is what David was on about earlier on. David said 40,000 years ago, his, his mistake was a naught 476,000 year old wooden structure. And that has been all over the news. So what this wooden structure is, there's a bit of wood there underneath and there's a bit of wood on top. Right. And there's another bit of wood there as well. Now, they've actually used thermal luminescence dating to date this. Right. And do you know what I'm going to do? We're going to, I've got the thermal luminescence uh, dating stuff, which is, you know, towards it, 
few pages on if I can if I've worked that out properly. But if I tell you about thermoluminescence dating and how they dated this, so get get your and get your gray cells working now. Right. Thermoluminescence dating works on when certain minerals were last exposed to the sun, right? And when when they've when they're exposed to the sun, they've got a certain charge, right? Um, and that charge can be dated, right? So so basically, um, if it's quartz, quartz, lumine thermoluminescence dating using quartz, which is naturally in sand, in muds and gravels, that, that's accurate to about 50,000 years ago, right? So when they needed to date this, they thought, right, we've got a bit of a problem, right? What do we use to date this timber, right? And what they've used is felspar, because in sand and gravel and all the rest of it, you get quartz and felspar and, and all the other different minerals. But those are the two ones that, that are really specific. So felspar itself. So basically what it is, when the last time this was exposed to the sun, the, 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 you, you can track on how degraded the felspar is after a long period of time, right? Um, and what they dated this to is 476,000 years ago. If that doesn't make any sense, we do actually revisit thermal luminescence dating because we've got it written on the screen and you can take some notes from that. But for me, as an archaeologist, uh, and from you as students of archaeology, um, you will agree with me that finding something of this date that's built by human beings is massively, wholly, incredibly important because they, OK, cut the cut the faff, right? Half a million years ago, just a couple of thousand years there, half a million years ago, these people were building structures, right? And so we start, so that screws with our minds. We don't know who built this platform, whether it was any relations to do with modern hominids, right? Maybe it was Australopithecines that had smaller brains and we, 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 you know, they couldn't have done this, but they clearly did, right? So structures, finding structures is massive and hugely, hugely important. And again, found in Africa in, as David said, Zambia. Mm -hmm. So there, 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 there we go. Um, and excavated by experts from Liverpool and Aberystwyth University and reported in the journal Nature. And apparently, when this came out, the guy who sent it to me, Henry, he said, have you seen the news? It's all over the news. I said, how topical can we get? This is big stuff, right? Um, and there it go. The discovery has no other construction parallels from the African or Eurasian Eurasian Paleolithic and predates our own species, Homo sapiens. Right. Or as we were, we're supposed to call ourselves, Homo sapien sapien. So. This itself is is part of an, a big project going on in Zambia at this minute. And the team discovered a possible it's a platform end of. Right. We don't need to go a cut notch, a cut nut notch at a site known by the Cambo Falls in Zambia. Analysis of the timbers showed evidence of cut marks made with stone tools, revealing that the early that early humans or hominids could shape and craft logs for a deliberate function, rather than being limited to just adapting sticks for weapons and digging and hitting people over the head with clubs. Usually women or women would do it to the man, whatever way you want to look at it. This not only extends the age range of woodworking in Africa, but expands the understanding of the te technical um, cognition, cognitive approach to understanding your cognitive development of your brain of early hominids. So uni uh, University of Liverpool, um, Professor Barnum, this has changed how I think about our early ancestors. Forget the label Stone Age. This is the Wood Age. Um, look at what these people were doing. They made something new and large from wood. They used their intelligence, imagination, skills to create something they'd never seen before. Something that had never previously existed. So when, when we're, this is, this is huge. This, this is huge. There's, there, there, you know, we, we go, 
for hundreds of thousands of years before anything like this is is ever thought about or known about in archaeology. But it, it comes from Africa. And, you know, they've also discovered four wood tools, included a wedge, perfect for woodworking, as you know, wedge, ideal for splitting wood, digging stick, well, digging for tubers, okay, cut lodge and notch branch, showing an early diversity of forms and the capacity to shape tree trunks into large combined structures. Right, okay, we, we want to, we, we don't need any of that, right? Um, but maybe we do. And, um, oh yeah, maybe we do. I, I just, this is, this is sort of in there because I was editing that video that I mentioned earlier on about what happened in Iraq in 2003, which I can't say in this video, but there you go. War itself, the intentional destruction of cultural and religious property during armed conflicts has been deemed a war crime in international law for over a century. So now you know why I did that video in 2003. Anyway, about 2003. This, and what we've got, we've got a little bit more about the timbers coming up, but it, it's just sort of the way this has worked today, actually. These are, these are eggs, eggs, eggs. And these eggs, um, this is actually reported in April, but I hadn't really seen these eggs before. These are, look, look at those eggs, perfectly well preserved. Now, I, I, I'm really not sure whether this comes under the category of buried eggs that you can dig up and you can still eat them because I'm sure the contents would have dissipated or whatever. I don't know. If you've got one egg that's been broken there, I, I like this because it was like from China and it was something different. Archaeos has made a remarkable discovery in um, Yingzhou province in eastern China. Among the artifacts uncovered was a jar containing eggs that date back to the spring and autumn period, um, somewhere in the region of 700, uh, somewhere in the region of 475 years BC. So incredible date there. Incredible. Uh, uh, amazing that we've got these eggs. Uh, dating back 2,500 years. However, only the shells of the eggs have survived the test of time. So that that again, that again is it's it, it, it's again what what we're seeing in archaeology now is is archaeology becoming very real. We all eat eggs, or we've got eggs in everything that we eat, right? So those eggs themselves. Um, I like a postcard. It's almost as if the people who put those eggs in there 2,500 years ago, their, their cognitive voice, their, their cognitive looking at this is what you're seeing today, right? And so what I've got now is Henry said, but you haven't covered this. And I said, actually... I have, we have looked at some new finds in, in Ireland, right? But I think what's happened, they found another house in Ireland, another Neolithic house. I remember saying a few weeks ago, they found a Neolithic house in Ireland. Um, they found another Neolithic house before that. They keep finding Neolithic houses. Right? So this dates to 6,000 years ago. The reason why I mention it, that there's something else about this little piece, right? We, we've done this bit before. 50 archaeologists working on uh, the construction of the M28 motorway, but we're talking about the, the archaeologists fully involved in, in this project. Um, just one of the 38 sites where they have been digging had been known about previously. But all the other sites are new to archaeology. The net gain to the public is enormous because the knowledge we get from a project like this can be quite staggering. And... Again, there's a location. I, I, I've not come across the name Bali Hemican before, a farmer's house. So I think this might be a new one on the list of the one that we did the other week. If it's not, we've got a little bit more detail. When you take it together in terms of the amount of infrastructure development over the last few decades, it really has been a complete game changer in terms of what we know about the archaeology of Ireland. So what we are doing is that these projects are giving us so much more information that we didn't have before. Now, that that bit underneath that last paragraph is something that I haven't come across before. This is why I'm saying this, this, this looks like it's a new building that's been found in the past few days or whatever. If it's not, 
let me explain why. Um, it's a simple timber structure, probably thatched, that would have housed a single family and there may well in the general vicinity have been other similar houses that form part of a community, a village. Hmm. Interesting. Ken Hanley, what's interesting about these is that there have been thousands of years of nomadic hunter-gatherer society in Ireland and these people introduced farming. Now, okay, we'll 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 let that we'll let that stay uh, as a statement, right? But we do know that they've got this is six thousand years ago. We do know that four thousand years before this, ten thousand years ago, they're cremating an island. Is that a sense of permanence? But we're not going to do any more about that. However, this is what is interesting. The evidence points to a community of people who arrived in Cork Harbour with their livestock and introduced their farming practices to what had been up to then a nomadic hunter-gatherer society. If that's true or not, however, the end bit, if that's not true or not, but that the idea that people are coming in with a new introduction of livestock and this sense of uh, this agricultural, in, in probably that right context, when, when I talk about agricultural revolution, I talk about structures and I, that's what I talk about. I talk about the um, ceramic um, legacy, you know, the pottery and so on. But this this is sort of using the word like um, that sort of agricultural sort of exchange as being that sort of new wave revolution that, that's hitting Ireland 6,000 years and more ago. And when you think about it as well, when you think about it, 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 what do you think about it? If these people are already living there, then it it, it says as well that it, that they may have actually got over to Ireland a lot earlier than that, maybe seven thousand years ago or so on. The evidence so far seems to suggest that it was an influx of people that they brought their livestock, their families, and the whole farming package with them, and they started building these houses. So it's basically the first farming community to arrive in this part of Cork Harbour, Cork landscape. It's extremely exciting find for us. It certainly is. Mr. Hanley estimates that the house was built sometime around 5,700 years ago, making it more than a thousand years older than the Egyptian pyramids of Giza. Now, I, I, it, it's always interesting when they make that comparison, but I think what we're trying to do is make archaeology relevant to our understanding because we always think about Stonehenge and we think about how influential that is. Um, and Pete's saying, yes, but it won't let me join. So I've got to say, what's happening? Bit of a pain when this happens. What's happening? Anyway, let's crack on. Now, this is, a, this is one of those new buildings. I've not seen this image before. That would seem somewhat of a slot trench around the outside right it when i'm describing a slot trench maybe there may have been timber in there it, it doesn't or is it it, it looks a quite a strange shape for any kind of defensive ditch to be honest with you so what does it and uh, um uh, pat's just joined us as well so if you could let her on um andy but so whatever this building is it's really difficult to say but i've not come across this if this is anything to do with the buildings that they're excavating or finding or understanding in County Cork, then this is a new image. And again, uh, they're really getting into it. And it's quite a sizable area, quite a sizable area. And what I was talking about is sort of, you know, a timber trench in uh, where you might put timber in there, uh, in the trench around and may have created some wall or is it actually a real ditch? Really difficult to say at this stage. Um, I'm just going to say to Peter, turn off and sign in. Right, there we go. I can't do any more. Uh, there we go. There they are excavating, massive area they're excavating in Ireland. And again, making records, trenches of the landscape. And this is actually from a completely different late date. There they go, uh, excavating there, a spearhead that dates to about um, 800 years AD. 1,200 years ago, so spearhead found on the excavated site. Again, it's not all the realm of metal detecting enthusiasts finding these things. Now, this is this is something else. And as I go through these, I've got to cross, cross them out on my little, little notebook. Um, and it's good to have you along, Pat, as well. 
Um, so, so this is, this is, Sorry. this is the next. Thank, nice to see you, Pat. Um, this is the next object I wanted to mention today. This is actually a sandal, evidence of a sandal in Ireland, right? But it says new discoveries suggest ancient humans wore more item, item wore modern items centuries ago. Right, this is from a few days ago. A one hundred and forty-eight thousand year old discovery suggests humans wore modern everyday items back then. In other words, shoes. Right. So, so what have we got so far in this lecture today? We've got buildings that exist nearly half a million years ago. Right. Which, which is which is which is amazing and we've got a sandal now evidence of a shoe right which which is which which again is is revolutionary so a new analysis of ancient footprints in south africa suggests that humans may have been wearing hard soled sandals and why let's read this the well preserved prints unusual characteristics may provide the oldest evidence so far that people use shoes to protect their feet from sharp rocks during the Middle Stone Age. Well, well that's actually wrong because um, that's wrong. The Middle Stone Age is the Mesolithic period. This is 148,000 years ago. This is the Old Stone Age. So they got that wrong. Although researchers are hesitant to come to firm conclusions, related to the use of footwear during the period. The authors of the study um, examined markings that had been left on stone slabs at three different locations on the Cape Coast, none of which have been directly dated. However, based on the age of other nearby rocks and sediments, suggest belief that the tracks found at the site um, called um, Klein's Kratz could be between um, 79 and up to 148,000 years ago. So again, it, it's, it's that sort of, it's, it's that, you know, the footprints uh, show no toes, discerning it from bare foot markings, and instead displayed rounded and anterior ends, both ends of the sandal, crisp margins and possible evidence of strap attached points. Similar markings uh, that are estimated to have been left between 73 and 136,000 years ago, being found at another site called Gukam, Gokama. And these are all in South Africa. Oh, God. Time is wearing me out, all this news. So, where are we next? Um, and, and I just got to... I can't, no other news from Pete, unfortunately. Stunning 2,000 year old Roman sculpture of the son of Neptune. Right, here we go. Let's show you the image. And this has been found in the past few days as well. And we'll go on to the article as well. Um, and as we're looking there, you can clearly see the bum cheeks there that look really strident and a nice back body there. Um, and I don't think the the frontage is as accurate as the rear looks, actually. But this is a little statue that's actually been found. So let's go back to what it says. Stunning 2,000-year-old Roman sculpture of the son of Neptune is found buried less than two feet deep next to the A2 in Kent. Um, a, a merman, it's a merman, a merman triton is seen riding on a sea monster um, in statue form at Tynum. That's where it's found in Kent, Tynum in Kent. In Roman mythology, Triton was the son of Neptune, the god of the sea. Spectacular Roman sculpture has been found buried little more than a foot um, deep. Um, it says, it says, doesn't it say, yeah, two feet there. Um, the unique stone statue depicts a triton, a merman with the torso of a man and the tail of a fish riding on a sea monster. Now, you know, it's really great that we're finding these and they're so, so well preserved. So if we go back to that, as a demigod, he could calm the waves by blowing on his conch shell, which he appears to be holding in the uncovered sculpture. Right. Okay. Um, 
is is that a conch shell which he's holding in his left hand? Might be. Um, and here we go. That part has been broken off, but artifacts, but artifact is otherwise in incredible condition. It was carved between um, sometime in the late noughties, some um, 80, 90 years AD into the 100s. The statue was found by archaeologists from Canterbury Archaeology Trust, Cantai, when they were excavating a site near the A2 in Tynham, Kent, ahead of a new housing development. The A2 follows part of the route of the original Roman Watling Street, which linked the Roman ports of Richborough and Dover with London and continued northwest via St Albans. And again, we're getting an idea of scale there. So it's not a, it's not a tiny statue, really, but it's it's well proportioned, um, and obviously a merman because you you've got the um, you, you you it definitely looks like a merman, doesn't it? And hang on a minute, and obviously you've got this really nice, interesting face, um, genitalia, belly button, breasts. Really looking good, but the rear end looks actually pre pretty more accurate than the front. And again, it's so well preserved. The arm, the arm, com the arms coming in there, they haven't been knocked off. So I'm going to say this has actually been deliberately buried. You chuck this in the ground, it's going to break, right? So it looks like this has been deliberately buried. Wonderful piece of archaeology, wonderful discovery. And obviously, if you went up this with uh, mattocks and shovels and all the rest of it, you you would you would damage things quite easily. So what what we were what we were saying earlier on is this find that we we come from Zambia that timber find, just to sort of remind us about that, and this find again again back to this find, and again that long piece of timber goes underneath that piece above, okay. So we're just going to read up a little bit more about this. This has sort of been updated since I um. Did, put this online so it goes on saying making fire okay further analysis confirmed the logs were about 476,000 years we've we've ascertained that from the Livingston Museum Zambia I was amazed to know that woodworking was such a deep-rooted tradition it dawned on me that we had uncovered something extraordinary until now evidence for the human use of wood has been limited to making fire and crafting tools such as digging sticks and spears. Can I just say one thing? This this is the point that we we know evidence of people making fires about one and a half million years ago plus, right? So, it it, it, it well okay. It, it's it's in hindsight, it's quite logical they would have found this. But if I, if this hadn't been found, I'd say well you know. Wow, we got a sandal. We got people walk using sandals. I, th I think the air of wisdom would dawn on you with thinking, well, actually, maybe there was more going on than actually meets the eye. We just haven't found the evidence, and so now we are finding evidence. So we'll read out this thermal luminescence dating thing, and we'll just we'll just see where it goes. Thermal luminescence. This might be a little bit more. Um, precise than I mentioned. One of the oldest wooden structures was a 400,000 year old spear in prehistoric sands at Clacton on sea. Wooden wooden structures, wooden discoveries, wooden discoveries. 400,000 year old spear in prehistoric sands at Clacton on sea, Essex in, in 1911. 400,000 year old, but that's not a building. It's it's a it's a spear, right? Unless it is preserved in very specific conditions, wood simply rots away. But in the meandering riverbanks above the Kalambo Falls, close to the Zambia Tanzania border, it was waterlogged and essentially pickled for millennia. Pickled. The team measured the age of the layers of earth in which it was buried using thermoluminescence dating. Grains of rock absorb natural radioactivity from the environment over time, essentially charging up like tiny batteries. I described it in a different way, and I'll, I'll explain why that is in a moment. And that radioactivity can be released and measured by heating up the grains, and that radioactivity can be released and measured by heating up the grains and analysis 
um, the light emitted. The size of the, and, and basically, um, I was, the weird thing was, I, I was listening to a BBC Radio 4 programme and they they were they were they were describing this and they were also describing what i've just said as well that that there's a deterioration right at the same time however there's a radioactivity um the natural radioactivity has has been absorbed into the felspar right absorbed into the grains and with that radioactivity that can actually be found released and, and measured by heating up the grains and analysis and analyzing the light emitted. So, um, yeah, as I say, it was, they described both ways and both ways that I've just mentioned are at odds with each other, but, um, I'll have to come back to that again. Um, I'm, I'm quite kerfuffled by that, but the main thing is what they are doing is using thermoluminescence dating to actually record this and the dates back to 700, 700, 476,000 years ago. So the size of the two logs, the smaller of which is about 1.5 meters, uh, suggests whoever fitted them together was building something substantial. Unlikely to have been a hut or permanent dwelling, it could have formed part of a platform for a shelter, the team says. Hang on a minute. If it's a platform for a shelter, that's a dwelling, isn't it? There you go. Uh, it might be some sort of structure to sit beside the river and fish, but it's hard to tell what sort of structure it might have been. It is also unclear what species of ancient human hominid built it. Um, and no bones have actually been found on the site so far, um, along with no other evidence. So it's it's really odd. It's really odd, this. It's a really odd find indeed. Ooh, you know, I don't know, I don't know why this is this is this is a lot harder this week. Because it seems, it seems I don't know why it seems that I, I've done it. I'm doing a lot of talking and um, not giving myself much of a break. But but the next thing that we're going to look at is in fact this. This is actually a cavalry sword, right? So uh, I don't know if we got any other. Right there we go. Oh there we go. These these wonderful cavalry swords. That right. Basically these are actually found in scabbards, right? So that there. Um, is based on 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 in oh I on right let's just let's just do let's just do a little bit of a thing yeah Hang on, right, let's get this on yeah and we'll look at the text uh there we go oh hang on a minute we don't want that clear we can move that there and hang on there not giving me much on the screen stop the annotation a minute stop that if we zoom Hang on, if we zoom in there, it's not going to let me do it. I, mean, hang on, I was trying to do something. Ah, oh, I can do it with this one. Right, hang on a minute. Let's try this one. Let's just do this there. All right. Okay, good. So that that's the length of the scabbard, right? And obviously the sword is actually in the scabbard, right? So there's the hilt, and that's where the pommel's going to be as well. But the these that there. And that there, are the are the far end of the scabbard. That's where the that's where the tip of the blade is actually held within that scabbard. And they found two of them, which is very very interesting, um, and a very very interesting find. And this is hang on, stop. And a metal uh, detector's discovery two two. 1,800 year old Roman cavalry swords still protected in remnants of their wooden scabbards or sheaves in the North Cotswolds. And again, cavalry officers or just normal, every well, the, the actual sort of nice <laughs> sort of boss on the far end seems to be indicative of a cavalry officer. One thing I will say anyone interested in the Romans, the, the, Roman, the Roman cavalry sword was about was about half half a length again as a normal infantry soldier's sword are actually more than that um so that's how we know that they were actually cavalry swords rather than what we would usually refer to as a gladius for a normal infantry legionary or an auxiliary soldier i i'm i'm i hope everybody's getting um 
loads of little bits out of this tonight. It's a little bit for everybody, actually. So I'm hoping that's sort of working and helping. And then we will go to Pompeii and we go to Stonehenge. What a mix. So here we go. Landslide reveals 2,500 year old richly decorated gold necklaces in Spain. A landslide in northern Spain has helped unearth two Iron Age gold necklaces that were likely buried in a hoard about 2,500 years ago. Two Iron Age gold necklaces. And this is what they look like. There it is. It's a golden talk. And I was, I was looking at that and thinking, um, there's, I think there's a little bit of gib give there actually and it, it is gold right there's a little bit of flexibility you put that around your neck on these these little terminals um i'm sure they would eat into your neck and um they're actually smaller designs of these that they're that actually used as bangles and there and there's there's designs of this which have actually been excavated but they found two of these and again this is a new find that's actually been reported as well so I wanted to bring that to you. Now, what is next? Now we we've got we've got that there, and I just um, I'm just going to um, I've just realised something that the the, the images for um, the the images for Pompeii are actually um on on my other device so i'm gonna have to get them over um and i'll get them over in the break right so i can't i can't promise i'll be doing i can't promise i'll be doing stonehenge in three parts but it's more likely i will so we'll be sort of bleeding into stonehenge next week as well because we, we've used up about 40 odd minutes so far looking at these other sites and these other places. And obviously, um, out of sync, we'll be showing you those those images from Pompeii. And we'll probably do that after the break. Um, so, Pompeii, not Pompeii, Stonehenge. My, my issue with Stonehenge, as I said last week, is that everybody knows something about Stonehenge. Or you sometimes get people who know more about Stonehenge than somebody giving a lecture on it. Because you've been there, you've read books, you've read another book, you've read another book, you've seen it on TV, and so on. And sometimes there's not a lot I can give to it other than controversy. But I promise to be pretty good today. And I won't be good next week. But what I wanted to do was to, I've got, I've got what, what our friend James Dyer says about Stonehenge. And I've got what English Heritage says about Stonehenge. And so, in fact, we're going to do both. Peter said he can't join us today because he just can't get on. And I, I don't know why, which is a bit of a shame. But uh, that's, uh, I'm just going to say. Um, sign into YouTube. Um, and it's it's not the same experience, but you could take part on that. Right. Okay. So, just quickly show you a few, few images, and there's sort of a reconstruction, and it's sort of shows various different levers and various different ways they feel Stonehenge stones were actually moved. Whether you want to agree with that image, image or not is for another day. But I will I will tell you I will tell you that Native American pop not Native American uh, native populations of the world would know how to move these stones and they still move these stones in different parts of the world. But when you get an archaeologist, a group of archaeologists trying to move these stones, um, we, we usually fail unless we start using the, the chosen material to move these stones vis-a-vis -vis seaweed, right? However, that's for another day.
But again, looking down at Stonehenge, um, the big question is, uh, was Stonehenge ever complete? Or and most people say it was. Obviously, it was a complete monument. We don't have all the stones at Stonehenge. And it's presumed it was completed. Stonehenge was under construction for, for a good 1,700 years, right? A good 1,700 years. Some say, some say there was stuff going on at Stonehenge a thousand years before that. So there we go. And what we've got is a few images. And these few images will lead us to the text that we're going to do that is associated with English heritage. Now, there you can see. Back in the 1920s, they moved one of the stones into position, right? So I'm going to be very calm and I'm going to say that the image that you see today is the result of lots of reconstruction work from the late 1800s into the 1920s and the 1950s as well. And we're going to leave that in a box until next week. There you go. There, there's them moving one of the capstones and one of the trilithon stones. And again, using modern machinery to do this. And all that was available to them in the 1920s. Yes, they were able to move this stone. And yes, they were able to even move bigger stones of 10 tons plus in weight in the 1950s. You know how, what I feel about archaeological sites on, and being able to see them in their buff raw without being reconstructed. Be, behave, Carl. And, but again, it, it gives you um, a visage of the past, Ozymandias's visage of the past. And When, when you frequent and you plan to go to Stonehenge, always be prepared to, to think of something quite small. It's not a big place, right? It's not a big monument. It's, it's, not, it's not a huge thing, right? And if you go there with the, with the idea that it's, it, it's a lot smaller than Avebury and it's not much bigger than Castlerigg, you you will not then be disappointed, right? And the reason why I've got to behave is that some of you might love Stonehenge. And it's easy for me to talk about archaeological sites like Wayland Smithy and to be critical of them because most of you haven't been there. But Stonehenge is a place that might have some good memories. So let's just be be good. So Let's go, let's sit, let's just sort of swap on to English heritage. Now, this is what drew me today. I thought, there you go. It used to be thought in 1725, it was a Roman work. It was a Roman temple um, from um, Inigo Jones. Um, Stonehenge restored 1725. Jones was so convinced that Stonehenge was built by the Romans because of its ge geometry and symmetry that he added another central trilithon to its reconstruction. So it's got six uh, sets of trilithons instead of five. And it does make you wonder, does it not, that if this guy had the money, would he have placed another trilithon in the middle there? And it does make me then wonder if that was the case, would they have looked at the site and thought that's not, that can't be there. Let's remove it. That's an interesting thing. That's an interesting thought really. And sort of trying to get the raison d'etre of the antiquarian interest on looking at these sites on, and bringing them into a rabid interpretation. I'm not sure it was in these this class or it was elsewhere. 
that in the 16, 1600s, 1700s, late 1600s, 1700s, th this was the age of the Hanoverians, and they wanted to offer the Hanoverians a history of Britain that had inevitably been doctored. And that's when lots of these sort of ad hoc reconstructions took place. Whether the reconstructions on paper, as in this case, or whether they're physical reconstructions. Antiquarian interest, the antiquarian world, we know that unlike this image today, we know that this site was excavated first in the 1620s by the Duke of Buckingham. And, and this, it says in the center of the monument, the excavation was undertaken in the center of the monument. What did that reveal? How much do we understand? How much did we really learn from that in the 1620s? And this was an excavation that was undertaken because there was a visit of King James II to the site. The king subsequently commissioned the architect um, Ingo Jones. I want to say Indigo Jones, but it's not. It's Ingo Jones to conduct a survey and study the monument. Jones argued that Stonehenge was built by the Romans. Now, we've, we've had this discussion a few times, and Andy knows exactly where I'm going to go now. Don't you, Andy? This, back in the past, they used to have reconstructions with a roof on Stonehenge. And, and, this is something you can put a let's put a roof on it right let hang on a minute let's let's start again let's use a bit of um red okay so what we're going to do let's put a bit of a roof on it okay and you've got the beams going all of these beams come hang on a minute let's start again i'm not good at this drawing um so what we're going to do if we do gentle there uh, we we've, we've got a beat hang on we've got a beam there hang on there We've got another beam there. Uh, we can put another beam there. More of these beams. Keep these beams going. Yeah. Um, interlock them, right? Let's have a bit of interlocking. Mm -hmm. uh, some people have actually believed that there was actually a roof on Stonehenge, right? Um, and when you think about an idea of a roof being on Stonehenge, it makes perfect sense there being a roof on Stonehenge because the trilithon stones in the middle are higher than the trilithon stones on the outside. And strangely enough, when I was building my 6.5 meter diameter house, I had, I, I, I didn't realize what I was building at the time, but I had six sets of these in the middle. I had six sets of these trilithon, the trilithons in the middle of the building, right? And then around the outside, I, I've got a load of other timbers and there's lintels that connect all the ones around the outside. And then I, I, I put timbers that connected from the outside into the inside. Right. And then I thought, oh, my God, I built a miniature Stonehenge, but mine's got a roof on it. Think about it, folks. Why? Why is it built that way? Why are the stones in the middle higher than the ones on the outside? Leave it there. Leave it there. Let's just not let, let's just try and give that as an idea. Right. Let's just put that in because it's been dismissed. It's been disregarded. It's been not really brought into the modern consciousness for many years. But I would say, as we will know, that the this arrangement, the 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 way the way the stones are organized in the middle, right, um, um, are using uh, more the ones in the middle are using mortise and tenon joints, right. Um, and, and basically, uh, what we've got is the ones on the outside are dovetailed together, right? 
And what what a, what does dovetailing and mortise and tenon remind you of? Carpentry. So the people who actually built this site were obviously carpenters working in stone. And there would have been timber long enough to have actually roofed this. Move away, Carl. Stop it. People are going to think you're some kind of um, crank. But I always like to put these ideas out there. Personally, I like to believe that. I think um, talking for Andy, I think he he seems to think about that idea as well. So, you know, I think that's still true, Andy. Anyway, so the antiquarian John Aubrey surveyed Stonehenge in the um, early part. Uh, start again. The antiquarian John Aubrey surveyed Stonehenge in the much later part of the 1600s and was the first to record the ring and pits, later named after him, the Aubrey Holes. Now, the Aubrey Holes are basically a series of holes that, um, if you look at the screen, you've got, you've got little eyes, right? There's, there's a load of little holes, 56 of these holes, which, which w w usually, when they, when they dig them, there's nothing in them, right? We'll describe where they are. They're called Aubrey Holes. They're named after him. He found these little depressions around. His studies of the stone circles in other parts of Britain led him to conclude that they were built by the native inhabitants rather than Romans or Danes, as others had proposed. Um, and also, as the Druids were the only prehistoric British priests mentioned in classical texts, he attributed Stonehenge to the Druids. But however, as an idea, as Druids as an idea existed 2000 years ago not four and a half thousand years ago, if you go with the Druid angle, which I don't. Aubrey's idea was expanded in the 1700s by the antiquary William Stukeley in about the 1720s, who surveyed Stonehenge and was the first to record the avenue and the nearby Cursus, um, the Cursus monument. Among Stuckley's theories about Stonehenge, he too thought it was a Druid monument. You can think what you like. However, if we, oh, hang on a minute, we've still got the drawing stuff there, move away. What you can actually see there um, is that that there is, hang on, hang on, if I, if I made this little thing a little bit, hang on, and hang on, is that way? That there is, in fact, um, the avenue, and the cursus is obviously out of shot. Uh, if we get rid of that, this is, in fact, a henge around it. So, in other words, that's why they call it Stonehenge, because you've got the stones, you've got the henge, hence the name Stonehenge. I've sometimes, I've sometimes referred to Stonehenge as a stone, Stonehenge, right? Or Stonehenge, Stonehenge, because it's given the name of what it is rather than Avebury, which is like Avebury, Stonehenge, right? So Stonehenge is actually Stonehenge, Stonehenge. Sorry to confuse you all. This itself is rather, we're rather indebted to this image because this image itself as you can see, was taken in 1906 from a balloon. This is a first known aerial photograph of an archaeological site. That's in fact incorrect, because if you want to describe the battlefield sites of the American Civil War as archaeological landscapes, there you go. However, I'm, I'm cutting hairs maybe, but it wasn't then when, when they were had balloons in the American Civil War. However, um, and taking photographs, but this, this itself, I, I like this image because again, it sort of points to Stonehenge looking slightly different than it does today. Really does. But, and obviously we've got we've got some reconstruction of we, what what we can see in the middle there. We got two trilithon stones sticking up. Three, uh, we got two sets, and there's not as many lintels on there because if you go to if you go to there, you could see you could see another one there. You could see another trilithon, and you can see a few more lintels on there and a couple more upright stones. Since the image 
that was taken in 1906. But again, go easy on what we're doing today. So th this, this for me is one, one thing that we do know of, and I, I, I can tell you I get very angry about when people like Mike Parker Pearson are sorry to go on about it, when he says, right, I, I've got another £100,000 this year to do more research in Stonehenge. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, no. I let, OK, Stonehenge is a great site. It's a great site. But w there's so much more we can learn from other sites because there's so much which we're learning from Stonehenge that we already know about, right? Trying to put things together, the artefacts and all the rest of it. That's my point. So we've got excavations in 1620. We've got other excavations. I'm sure Stokely and Aubrey did a little bit of a digging. And what, what we've got, we've got people firing a local hammer and a chisel from Amesbury just down the road. Um, and they go to Stonehenge to break a little bit of one of the blue stones or one of Sarsen's stones off as a keepsake and a memorial. So early excavations and survey work were in 1874 and 1877 by the eminent, the preeminent archaeologist at the time, Sir William Flinders Petrie. So there's a name that we haven't heard for ages. Surveyed stone engine detail and devised the numbering system for the stones that is still in use today. Right. So this, 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 this itself, um, this site being excavated by um, being surveyed, and I'm sure he did some excavation work, um, in 1874 and 1877, um, is some of the first early advanced work that we've got in um, in recognising the archaeological site at Stonehenge, again, by Sir uh, William um, Flinders Heatry. Now, again, modern survey work is constant. Concerns about the stability of the stones are as today as they were in the past, especially after one of the sarsen stones and its lintel had fallen down, led to the straightening of a large leaning trilithon in 1901. Right. So that that's obviously one of the ones in in the middle, these these trilithons in the middle. Again, going back to the the aerial view. There you go. And Professor William Gowland uh, directed excavations around the base of the stone and, and based on the finds, he proposed a late Neolithic or early Bronze Age date for Stonehenge. And again, that's really important that we're actually getting our first dating evidence from 1901, our first real dates, Neolithic, Bronze Age, reuse site. So again, that's really essential to try to understand what we, what we are feeling or what we do understand about this this wonderful monument of Stonehenge, and and again, okay, let, let's just get my loathing away from this. Okay, um, it, it, it's a great monument. It, it's it's unique. It's it, it's it's built over a long period of time. It, it it's it, it is the prehistoric site that that really puts us on the map anywhere on the planet right there's there's nothing like this anywhere right so it is absolutely from those angles massively important to our understanding of the neolithic and then into the bronze age world and also one one thing that i will say if i miss it this week and next week is that the romans recognized this as an ancient monument in their time yeah they they, they saw this as an ancient monument when they were in britain because when you think about it, when the Romans were here, say, say, say you had a Roman officer and his wife and a couple of um, or maybe a Roman family that they, 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 they're visiting from Italy. There you go. They're visiting from Italy. Um, this is known about that they visited this site. And when I say it was 100 years A.D., the this would have been 2000. 3,000 years older than them, than, than, than their visit, right? So, again, it makes it more fitting and relevant to say that. Um, and we're not the only ones to marvel at this site. And also, also 
we're we're reminded that it's still there today. Why why didn't they demolish it? Why wasn't the monument demolished? Why didn't they simply get rid of it, right, and use it to construct the local roads? You you have had loads of material to construct the local roads. So I, I'm thinking, I'm thinking that this is important, not just in the Roman period that we mentioned, not in the period that they built it. But in all periods in between, and all periods in between from then until the modern day and age. So, again, this this is a nice image, which is one that um, is quite cute, really. And there's Atkinson there, the guy there. There, there he is, Atkinson in the trench, right? Uh, isn't somebody light in his? <laughs> I think so. I don't know. A further program of restoration and excavation um, um, led before this image by Lieutenant Colonel William Hawley was carried out between 1919 and 1926, when most of the south southeastern half of the monument was excavated. Right. So again, when we when we when we go look at this site and we think, right, you know, um, we, we, you hold chunks of this site have been excavated even before Richard Atkinson is actually excavating the site. So Richard Atkinson is excavating the site uh, in, in the trench second to the right. So there we go. There's Atkinson there. And, and team excavating the blue stone circle in 1954. And there's a guy with an iPad. No, it can't be. It's 1954. <laughs> but, but anyway... Again, this is this again is giving us more data, more information. This is a wonderful image from Historic England Archive. And again, this this is this goes with the absolute massive fascination. I think other than the great pyramids at Giza, uh, other than the three great pyramids at Giza, Stonehenge is the most investigated, most written about, most understood most published, most whatever site anywhere on the planet, right? And I don't know if I'm right in this statement, but over a thousand books have been published on Stonehenge, at least. I think the Great Pyramids is something like 10,000, but this, or even more, you know, there's new, a few new ones coming out every single year, but this, this again is, is the epitome of, of what archaeology is. This, this is. this is out there. So what we're going to do, I think at this point now, we should have a break. I'm feeling a little bit knackered by my non-stop talking for an hour and an hour and five minute, minutes it's been without interruption. And I'm going to see where we are. So let's just stop. And let's go and say... Where hey, and uh, Pat has turned into a box. <laughs> right, okay. So uh, we're mi we're missing the other four, aren't we? Andy, anything you want to say say uh, for us, please? Uh, no, I'm kind of yeah. Stonehenge is a bit of an enigma, isn't it? It's been messed around with so much. Uh, lots of interesting re research into it, and I was I've always wondered. Yeah. Uh, how uh, uh, at what points in time what it actually looked like and there's they they have yeah down at the site at the um information center down there they show you various stages and you're thinking yeah but did it really look like or did it just you know was slowly developed over the thousand years or 1500 years or whatever and never ever looked like any of those things you know? and like you said so, yeah, those kind of cross members would carry a roof very easily you yeah. know well, I, I've managed to do it, and even though my building's a lot smaller, the the you know you've actually made a good you've actually made a good point that uh, that this was a site that was in progress over let's just cut the path for two thousand years, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I'm going to say it. Maybe by the time they had completed the outside circle, maybe one of the trilithon stones in the centre had collapsed. Yeah, why not? Um, and maybe, maybe they 
some of the blue stones were damaged by uh, and and it never it never ever really looked at like the reconstructions as perfect as you're saying and and you you you're dead right andy you really really are yeah you, you, i mean you really, yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe it was never meant to be complete you know maybe it was just an ongoing thing that showed devotion or love or whatever you know so. De development of the mind cycle yeah why not and and how how am i you know do you know what right i've I built this thing here, right? And I've just been saying for the past two months, I've had enough. I can't be bothered doing any more, right? So what we were going to do, lots, we, you know, we were going to have another flooring underneath, uh, like an insulation flooring. Instead mm -hmm. of we've we've actually sealed all the all, all the all the panels, all all the planks together. Yeah, I was going to do this and I was going to do that, and I've never done it. Maybe I'll do it in the future, and at that point the roof will collapse. I don't bloody know. <laughs> but but you are dead. You are dead right, Andy. We will. You know, we we never, you know, for example, I, I've got I've got to finish a little bit more beading on the windows, right? And uh, I might I might accidentally put a hammer through the window because I've slipped. So, mm -hmm. um, so we might board up that window for a while. So you you'll never see it in. Yeah, yeah I see it. I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, you ev everybody anymore. everybody's houses are like that. They've all got jobs that need doing, and they uh, they're, they're never perfect. You know, Trina's is. <laughs> uh, this is true this no. is true this is true talking about things being perfect david anything you want to say in the break no thank you okay right greener no thank you not at the moment okay that that's that's fair enough and who have we got next anne the finding of the structure the wooden structure um they suggested it was sort of pre, you know, uh, uh, almost a creature before Homo sapiens. I mean, I mean, if you think of uh, the apes, which didn't develop quite as, I mean, there, there would just have sticks to poke to get a honey, or you know, or they'll wash wash potatoes in salt water in the sea. But but if they were already into design and construction of something quite large you, you know one wonders how fast mankind developed his intelligence it seems to point to some major intelligence doesn't it that you probably wouldn't have expected yeah i think yeah, yeah or, or or has been lost intelligence that's been lost i i I've, yeah <laughs> you, you, you know i'm gonna say i i've said this a few times right i was reminded of it the other day Somebody said, "Oh, but you're right, Carl." And 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 I just thought I don't like being right like that. It's just like this. I it's just like um, you know we we've 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 got um, David um, worked on Concord, right? And we're thinking, right, okay, that 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 was in the 1970s, right? Um, that was a supersonic aircraft, right? Um, and I don't go with this that we that we haven't developed anything like that since because we don't have the money right um the way technology works is if you want to advance and continue with your technology you're going to keep designing these things we don't have we don't have those levels of supersonic um aircraft on this planet anymore and this was over 50 years ago right mm. um even though we've got computers that seem to do everything for us we've we've taken lots of technological um um, backslides, for example, in the South Wales Valleys, they're electrifying the train line with overhead electrification buildings that look like something out of the 1950s. Um, and the point I'm trying to make is, is that we, we, we seem to be um, declining in, in technology, right? We, we, we may, we, we've got buildings made of rack, Right. And we've got buildings that need to come down. Well, the Romans built the, the Pantheon, right, which is a concrete roof, which is still standing over after 2000 years. Mm -hmm. And you're thinking, is there something in what is there something in what Anne said, which is a lot more deeper? And I think there is. I really think there is. And I think we need to take a we need to take a, <laughs> a lifestyle check at humanity. And start to work out are we really 
going in the right direction because it seems that in some ways of our technology we seem to be declining one last thing right you can all shout out and say i'm wrong we, we had the wright brothers their first flight was it in 1906 or whatever and and um we still get aircraft that go into the sky um oh, if something <clears throat> happens up in the sky you die right why haven't we got safe aircraft that we can just uh, we don't need to put belt seat belts on. We, we're up in the sky. It just drops down to the earth. It's still alive. Why have we got the technology to save people who, who are in plane crashes? The answer is, is that our technology hasn't really advanced. I'm sorry, you might all disagree with that, but that's what I feel. In some ways, well, I was reading somewhere that probably, um, mo well, it, it, it varies because of a big variety of competence in anything. But um, the hunter-gatherer, on the whole, had to use his brain a lot more to, to, to get even food, you know, in, in, than most of us do today. So probably we're all a lot dimmer than we used to be. The, the, the thing is, how do you collect, how do you collect um, honey from um, a honeybee's nest without, um, without, without them stinging you and killing you? But they, they, they yeah. did, right? Yeah, um, yeah. No, most of us, most of us, most of us would run away from from bees, right? Uh, and um, you know, they, they 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 knew this stuff, and lots of it has been lost. <laughs> On that note, oh Pat, is Pat there? No, not like. Well, okay. Well, I gotta do. I gotta do three things in the break. I've gotta get a cup of tea. I've got to get those images of Pompeii over, and I've also got to um, contact Pete. So I, I, I will be. So it's uh, nine o'clock. Um, I don't need to do anything outside because everybody's been fed and stuff. So I'm just going to stay at my station. And we will be back at 10 past nine. I'll see you then, folks.
Will the storm tomorrow impact your job, Andy? Do you think? Sorry, did the storm storm tomorrow what? Will the storm tomorrow impact your job, your work tomorrow? Uh, it could do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, um, it's not a particularly high tide, but it, I think it's about a nine meter or something. And it, but it, with that amount of storm yeah. and anti-cyclone pressing down on it, it could bring it up a meter, which will put it up mm -hmm. onto the, onto the roads unexpectedly. Uh, yeah. uh, and, and the wind of course can catch people out as well. So yeah. Yeah. But hopefully not, but. Yeah, let's hope it isn't bad as they're sort of suggesting it might be. I, it, it'll be it'll be dead. it'll be strong winds. It's just the first one of the season. So mm. anything loose will become looser. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Well, the last storm we had, I know my neighbours had their they have a you know cupboard top against, yeah. against the house. And the roof came off that. It was all, you know, yeah. no problem. At, Real problem. At, at the moment, it's coming from the uh, the south and the southwest. And, of course, the knot will protect us from that. So mm. um, if it, as long as it stays in that direction, which it looks like it might. But, um, we'll we'll be, right. we'll be, yeah, we'll be all right. So. Right. So, sorry about the slight delay. Um, I was trying no to get the images over, and I, I've, I've been – I can't seem to do it. I've spoken to PT's uh, – I've told him that he needs to update his computer and stuff. And you're talking about a storm. We've been having storm weathers. Uh, we've been having stormy weathers down here for the past four or five days. Really, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. really high winds. Uh, we've had two two days of non-stop rain, and you're saying you haven't had that. We've had some rain, but not non-stop. Yeah, we've had we've had non-stop non rain some days, and and the winds have been really really strong you know we we've... Uh, they're going to get worse there's a there's that the the main part of this storm hasn't come in yet so um so to, it's gonna, so, it's be... to, today and tomorrow so. it's going to be more stormy than it has been yeah strong, stronger winds from the from the southwest so yes there were issuing right. warnings today mm -hmm. about the storm. Oh, right. yeah it was a yellow warning over the almost yeah. the entire country yeah. Today, but it, uh, certain areas will get hit a bit harder tomorrow. Not a lot, but. All mm right. -hmm. So batten That's down right. your hatches. <laughs> well, basically, uh, because some of the render on the outside of the building hasn't actually um, bonded properly, we we lost we lost. Um, some of the lime mortar on the outside of the building. Oh, yeah. Oh, All right, that's not good. So it's just, uh, so, yeah, it's just having to do that again. So it's having yeah. to use more lime, uh, and we're using more, um, we're using more sheep's wool in it now. So uh, I, I did, I did, I, I've been trying to send these images over, right, and uh, to here, and uh, I, I, I actually, I chucked, chucked an image in there as well. Um, of the um, of of the roundhouse, but unfortunately, um, it doesn't. They don't seem to have come over. So uh, we'll have to we'll have to do that. We'll have to do that next week. Then the Pompeii images, unfortunately. Right. Anyway, let's crack on. Um, I wonder if, if Pat's not there at all now, is she? No, she's gone. Very odd. We did hear her say something, didn't we? I think I think she said hi. Um, I haven't got anything from her. Right, okay, let, let's crack on. Share, 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 Sunny and share. Right, okay. Right, go. It's a bit quieter not having everybody else here, isn't it? <laughs> Not having Margaret and, and uh, yeah, and we have everybody. all the noisy ones here. I have all the naughty ones, <laughs> yeah, exactly. A select um, group, <laughs> select group tonight, exactly. Um, uh, right, okay, let's uh, let's try and get back to these images. I managed to get my tea sorted anyway.
Right. OK, let's get back into it. OK, we we were no doubt talking about when uh, we were looking at uh, Stonehenge and we were looking at uh, their, their work at Stonehenge and, and obviously excavation work, which is clearly there. I think the, these these images of excavation work is absolutely great. They really are. Uh, no hard hats there, Andy. No high vis, um, which obviously standards have improved. But no doubt the work of can't Richard tell Ash that it's black and white. <laughs> shut up, Andy. <laughs> uh, shut up. So restoration and research. So between the 1950 and 1964, Richard Atkinson and Stuart Piggott of um, the dig fame of Sutton Who fame and a chap, chap by the name of uh, Stone undertook a new campaign of excavations, partly to resolve some unanswered questions left by the holy excavations and earlier excavations and in 1901. And they, they wanted to they wanted to really understand this site, to understand if archaeological excavations have assisted and aided the destabilization of the stones. Um, and the future of the monument overall and how the future of the monument overall should be restored and conserved to the standard that it is today. And th there's what we will see is there is something known as back in the 19. 50s, it was believed that there was a three stage chronology to this site. And this is in the 1980s, where there's actually a four stage chronology to the site, as proposed by James Dyer, which we will do in a short while. So back back to that uh, wonderful image back in the trench. I do like this image, actually. And Unfortunately, no detailed archaeological report was completed, but the excavations were published in 1995. So when, when you've got, right, the, 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 there's a technical problem there. When you're excavating an archaeological site, it's very important to publish your results, right? Um, and it's quite surprising that people like Atkinson and Piggott didn't publish their results back in the day, which is quite unusual for them. They probably had too much on, but you shouldn't engage in archaeological excavation unless you can publish your reports, which obviously um, I've got everything set up to do mine very, very soon. Um, and what they did is sort of discuss these excavations in some kind of form in 1995, but not all the details. And, and that's a shame, really. So um, on the nail of 1966, that's a lovely artefact, on the nail of uh, 1966, this is an excavation of 1966, but sort of changes where we are. Excavations in 1966, 1967, in advance of new visitor facilities led to the discovery of Mesolithic pits or post holes in the car park. The stone and here we go. This is where this comes in. The Stonehenge Archer burial was found in the ditch in 1978. This is the um, 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 th this is I think is this this ain't legendary called the, the Amesbury Archer, is it? Anyway, Stonehenge Archer burial found in a ditch in 1978, and a trench dug alongside the old A3444 revealed a new stone. Hole, a possible partner to the heel stone, and this is this is the whole point. One one of the reasons why there, I don't think I've got an overall image of this. Um, not that one. I don't think. Yeah, the, the road there. You can see the road coming in there. That road itself. Uh, there's another stone which they've actually found, uh, which which cuts through this monument, which they're saying that they found uh, in 1978. So going going back to the images again, going back, thinking and understanding the landscape. 
In the wider landscape survey work was undertaken by the Royal Commission on Historical Monuments and a programme of field walking and excava excava excavation. Um, the Stonehenge Environments Project was completed. Now, when when we when we again think about this wonderful landscape and how changes are occurring and what this site actually means to the overall scale they 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 do actually put in many ways amesbury um uh, start, start again stonehenge into sort of um cotton wool and and that in many ways is a good idea but it's very contradicting and very um confabulated in fact that um, certain times that you can actually go there and wander around the stones and it does actually cause quite a lot of damage. From 2002 there was renewed interest in investigating the Stonehenge landscape as here in 2012. Um, it investigated the landscape particularly on the eastern side of the World Heritage Site. This is a World Heritage Site, the World Heritage Landscape that also includes the likes of Avebury. Excavations in, in 2002, so we've got uh, an image of the 2008 excavations there um, to the south uh, to the south of Amesbury uh, led to the discovery of the Amesbury Archer. Yeah, I'm oh, sorry, I got that mixed mixed up earlier on. So there's an archer associated with Stonehenge, and there's another archer, uh, the remains which was found in 2002 associated with the Amesbury Archer. This little bit of a gold object with a gold hair um, ornaments associated with the Amesbury Archer a burial, which is completely separate from the one found in uh, 1978, uh, which was the Stonehenge um, Archer. And this guy that they found this associated with, and I'm sure we will come on to the Amesbury Archer again, he had lived in continental Europe before being buried in the earliest Bronze Age um, burial that we found with with gold objects ever found in britain many other important burials and and late neolithic pits and posts have been found associated with the stone age uh, stonehenge landscape three three miles south um, and we we think again back to this image and we think excavations in 2008 by a project led to the discovery of evidence for Roman activity at Stonehenge in the form of a large pit seen here in the centre of the trench. So they found Roman material at the site, which is which puts a new narrative onto it. So when Andy mentioned earlier on, this is a good point, when Andy mentioned earlier on that you, you look at the site and was it ever like the way that they say it looked like when it was being used over a period of 2,000 years? And then you look at the Roman period. What were the Romans doing there? What did the Romans actually see? What would be very interesting, what would be very interesting is to find a document and a plan from the Roman period showing the site, which is probably never going to happen. But what we've got here is evidence of Roman activity at Stonehenge, which is quite amazing, really. And... Again, this 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 is from 2008. Mike Parker Pearson, in charge, I think, of this excavation in, in 2008. He excavated the effort 2003 to 2009. So Professor Mike Parker Pearson, and he he was obsessed with the hypothesis that Stonehenge was linked to the ceremonial timber and earth complex at Durrington Walls via the River Avon. Um, obviously, the links and association with that, um, and there's discussion. The archaeologists found a roadway or avenue linking the Southern Circle at Durrington uh, walls to the river, which is a completely different site. We need to look at Durrington. I need to take a note of that. We, we do need to look at Durrington. In fact, Durrington is a fascinating site and I do need us to look at Durrington. Um, and obviously at Durrington, there's small houses and buildings made of timber and chalk, which we which would be good to look at. Analysis of the evidence at Durrington, which we've discovered that we will do again, um, of the animal bones and pottery from this settlement has provided new insights into feasting rituals and movement of people who built and used Stonehenge. So we're told. So. There's been a lot more investigation. There's lots of barrows around. Uh, Stonehenge, there's lots of various other monuments. There is 
in fact the Cursus Monument, the Cursus Monument, which is nearby us, as, as well as the avenue that heads away from the site, lots of other standing stones as well. As part of the uh, as part of the project, um, you at Stonehenge, what they did, uh, other than working in the centre here where they found actual Roman evidence, what they did, they actually excavated. This is actually one of the early stages of Stonehenge. These holes are actually called Aubrey holes. There's 56 of them. And interestingly enough, what they did, they excavated some of these holes. And to and, and they they were aware th that these had been excavated. And when they'd been excavated in the past, the person excavated and put the artifacts back in the hole, which is great. So when I excavated these in 2008, these Aubrey holes here, um, to retrieve cremated burials, which had been in, reinterred within Aubrey Hall 7. So when these holes were excavated, right, the all the evidence from these holes was put into one of the holes, number seven. Analysis of the remains has shown that they represented more than 50 people, both male and female, and of various ages, which is, again, a really interesting point. And obviously, when we come back to Stonehenge next week, we can maybe look at some more of these issues. These people were buried at Stonehenge between, this is very interesting now, between 5,000 and four. 1,800 years ago, right, in these holes. The remains of these individuals were buried in these holes. When they were originally excavated, the, the excavator take, um, 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 had taken all the evidence out of them and actually put them all the, the bone evidence back into one of the holes, as I said, number seven. But it's good that they did that because if they'd have been put in a box somewhere, they'd probably fallen apart after these hundreds of years. Studies of their bones showed that not all had been living within the local area during the last 10 years of their lives, suggesting that people may have brought their cremated dead to Stonehenge from some distance away. Now, that in itself is very, very interesting. The movement of human remains across the country. And actually, it's quite it's quite good that Margaret's not with us because I'm going to say something that may have upset her. And when when she um, where did she go? Did she go to um, where did she go to Menorca to take her um, husband's remains? Anyway, she'll tell us all about it all next week. He wanted to he wanted his remains to go there and and so that they could spread the ashes. And Margaret's really upset with the fact that she's got nowhere to go to remember her husband, Tony, but that was who wishes, right? And that's that's many miles away from, from Arnside. And in a way, they, they, they did that type of thing back then. They, they carried the remains of people distances to take them to this site and take them to lots of other sites. But there's a problem with that. And can anyone see the problem? Well, the problem with that is, is, that means that whenever we find human remains at some places, they it doesn't actually represent, doesn't necessarily represent the people who actually live there because the bones may have been carried a long distance. So when when you when you um, when you analyze bones and evidence from these sites, the answer basically is for any other lecture that you come to with me to just ask the question, are the bones that Carl's talking about, bones of somebody that came from 10 miles away, right? To say, for example, um, say, say for example, we found human remains at Castle Rig, right? And we studied those human remains at Castle Rig. And it said that they, those people had, they, they had lived 20 miles away. And but they want to do that. Then they move to Castle Rig. But then again, they may never have lived at Castle Rig. The bones may have been burnt somewhere else and they may have carried those 20 miles all the way to Castle Rig. So we've got to be very careful looking at archaeological evidence. And it, it's you when when you're an archaeologist, you've got to be very forensic and ask those questions continually. And as you know, when we're doing these lectures, somebody can say something and it's like we've got it. We've worked it out. But when, you know, we can't always have the answers. We can't always know what's going on with, with the archaeology. So, you know, what, what, what we've got is going back to 
of that trench there, they the this this revealed Roman activity. That big trench there revealed Roman activity. Don't expect to find it. And the Romans had dug a large pit or a shaft there. And the question is why? What what? And the other thing as well is. What were they doing at Stonehenge digging holes if they respected it so much? Maybe if they extended that hole, they might actually find more archaeological evidence. How do we know? One of the massive activities that we've got over the landscape is laser surveying. That So uh, this is from 2012, laser scanning of Stonehenge. Um, the investigation identified traces of stone building on virtually every um Hang on, the investigation identified traces of stone working on virtually every stone, revealing significant evidence of how Stonehenge was built. So in other words, what we're saying is that, you know, there was a high degree of stone masonry, high degree of craftsmanship with each of these stones that was found at Stonehenge. With looking at the landscape survey and looking at the wider landscape as well within this wonderful World Heritage Site. So lots of these surveys are actually available on the internet now and you and they reveal various new information and phasing at the site, which Andy was talking about, the different phasing. So in other words, what we're talking about, we, we, we can't really talk about, because the site's over an incredible length of time, we can't say, oh, they, they, they dug a ditch with with a with a mound on the inside then they dug the Aubrey holes right um, oh but that all happened at the same time uh, oh then they moved in the blue stones oh but but they moved right but that was all in like four phases you can't do it you can't do it like that this is over an incredible period of time these people didn't think like we do today for example i need to get my house done because winter's coming and i need it done now right i need i need to get it completed it has to be done now and can somebody um, enter pat, pat back in please so you know these people in the past lived and breathed these sites for an incredible length of time and what they are finding on lots of the stones at stonehenge is carvings carvings of axes carvings of other things they're actually in the grass around stonehenge at different times of the year they're finding part marked um, in the grass. So if you go back to, if you go back to this aerial photo photograph, this one here, if you notice, there's another circle there, right? There's another circle there, and and you know there, there's all these different things, and and in fact, with with using lots of these, you know, parch marks spotted in the grass. This may be from 1906. But spotted in the grass during a hot spell in the summer of 2030 led to renewed debate about whether the Sarsen Stone Circle was completed or not. Andy, you didn't know that, did you? Um, so, you know, it, it's it's that thing, you know, um, it's talking about seeing parts marks in the grass during hot spells in the summer led to renewed debate about whether the Sarsen Stone Circle was complete. What does that exactly mean? Does it mean to say it was complete? Does it mean it wasn't, right? But the one thing, actually having that idea of, that was something that we said earlier on. Was it actually complete? Andy said it, I said it, this is a thing. This, this is the wonder of history and archaeology, that when we look at things in the past, were they always ever complete? For example, near me, it's in my book, Romans in South Wales, Oh, by the way, I'm reprinting that because the 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 other two versions were really successful. And in that book, I talk about Roman evidence of Roman forts near Neath, right? And um, and actually, they never completed the forts; they just practiced them. They just they just made a bit of a fort and they just left it. They were practicing. So even in the past, they were practicing how to do things. So within the wide wider landscape. We use geophysics, they're finding new round barrows, you know, they might even find new cursus monuments. And interestingly enough, they're, they're starting to work out. And this is a site that we need to come to. It's called Westwood, Westwoods. Um, and they're actually saying that they, they think they know that this locality, and, and I actually I haven't for, a bit um, taken over by time and research today. I, I'm not exactly sure Westwoods where Westwoods is, but we they they believe that that site itself. Actually, do you know what we should do? We should look at Google. Why not? Let's work out where the site Westwoods is. Right. Okay. Let's uh, go. 
Hang on, let's not do that. Westwoods. Um, it's going to be in Wiltshire, so we're going to type in there Westwoods. Let's see where this site is. Um, it might not find it because that might be quite a popular name. Westwoods. If we type in Wiltshire, let's see if we can find Wiltshire. Hang on. Um, yeah, it is a place located to the south of Marlborough, Savannah. Well, so, yeah, Westwoods is Savannah Forest. There it is. It's another name for Savannah Forest. So if we if we go and work out, so if we bring that down there, uh, Stonehenge. So they do believe that the stones actually came from Savannah Forest at a place known as Westwood. And there it is. Stonehenge in relation to Westwood, what we're talking about, 10, 15 miles. That's where they're talking about where the stones came from for the construction of Stonehenge. So that's, they believe, West, a site known as Westwood. I'm glad we did that. At least we know where it is now. And back to where we were. Back and, okay, go. And there. Next image. And what they're, what they're trying to do as well is with the with the wider um with with the looking at stonehenge what they're trying to do is link stonehenge engine with other sites for example the last few years have brought exciting discoveries in 2017 a new causewayed enclosure an early neolithic monument comprising uh, circuits of segmented ditches was uncovered at lark hill which is just to the north of stonehenge during excavations before the building of a new new army housing Interesting. Then in 2020, the Stonehenge Hidden Landscape Project announced the discovery of a large circuit of shafts, possibly natural sinkholes or artificial pits surrounding the Hedge Monument at Durrington Walls. Yeah, we've got to do Durrington Walls because it's a Neolithic site. I'm, I'm, I'm a miss why I haven't done that yet. Later in the year, 2020, the researchers used novel geochemical approaches and analyze, analyzing um, the landscape of Stonehenge, analyze, extracting, um, they're saying that approach analysed a core extracted from Stonehenge to pinpoint the probable origin. As we know, Savanac Forest has actually got you 15 miles north. They're saying as well, thanks to the work of Mike, Mike Parker Pearson and me not being critical for once, more recently, a new bluestone um, monument was found in the Priscelli Hills known as um, vine mine, my vine mine, my vine mine. I have to say that vine mine. Um, its similarities to Stonehenge are intriguing, except it is a circle, uh, uh, not like the um, trilithon stones. They include the shape and size of unspotted dolerite stones, the potential alignment of the gun site entrance on mid wind, midsummer solstice, um, and it's talking about. There's empty stone holes at this site in West Wales, suggesting that at least six blue stones were removed from the site at some point. Now, we already know about that, folks, right? Just because there's a hole in the ground doesn't mean to say there was a there was a stone in it. But they're saying that, that this site in West Wales, there were stones in these holes. And it seems likely that at least the, the three existing known and, and spotted dolerites at Stonehenge were brought from here. Well, they say they were, um, but we'll go with their wis wisdom. Um, and finally, because we're going to go on to James Dyer, we're going to do James Dyer for the last um, section of this presentation today. But finally, uh, researchers examining the DNA of early Bronze Age people buried in Stonehenge area have found close genetic relations between people buried in cemeteries at Amesbury Down, which is not too far away, um, Porton Down and Willsford. These appear to be groups of related people who came, it's said, from the con con continent and continue to intermarry among themselves sep um, separately from the local Neolithic population. Um, can I just make one point, right? If the stones did actually come from West Wales in the way they say they came from West Wales, Shouldn't they be finding human remains, DNA, which would link um, the DNA from people or strontium analysis, which would link people from the Stonehenge landscape and Amesbury, right, with West Wales, which is what they haven't found. 
surely if you're bringing stones from Westwell, some of your people would die uh, in the Stonehenge landscape. They found none of that evidence. Again, going back to how the stones got there, I've got my theory. Most people have got theirs. Right. OK, finally, what we're going to do, we're going to we're going to look and we're going to go to our friend James Dyer's book, Ancient Britain. And again, this is um, a stereotypical way that they believe the stone end was constructed. Those those stones there, we're, we're talking about those sort of heel stones there are the ones where the road goes through. The bottom right hand side of the image. Very interesting reconstruction here. Um, the bank doesn't look complete. Um, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. Interesting reconstruction. And this is our phases that James Dyer tells us. We'll, we'll just, we'll, we'll go over this individually. Uh, now, James Dyer says, there can be little doubt that the best known example of a henge is Stonehenge itself. Well, I would rephrase that. The, the best known example of a Stonehenge is Stonehenge itself. Stonehenge, Stonehenge. Uh, which indeed gives its name to the whole group. It's a very complex monument with a development spreading, James Dyer says, over 1,700 years. I, I've rounded up to 2,000. I actually think it's a lot longer than that, to be honest with you. I think we're all out. It seems logic to discuss its complete history. There is some degree disagreement amongst experts as to the precise order of construction, but Professor Richard Atkinson's scheme is generally accepted. Um, and that's mainly set out on page, uh, on the image there. But Atkinson said there was three phases rather than the four that is actually shown there. So here we go. Let's, let's just look at that. The caption there, reconstruction sketches suggest the probable development of Stonehenge. One, there it is. And then a single entrance henge with the heel stone. Two, um... And where, where you've got the, the, the avenue and the blue stones are added together with the four station stones. The four station stones are uh, the ones in the angles there, which, which we're going to have a quick look at in a moment. Um, and then it says phase three. There you go. The Sarsen stone circle is constructed. Uh, and there, there it is, the, the, the big sort of um, sarsen stone in the middle there. And then it says, and the blue stones are re-erected in an oval inside the sarsen circle and the Y and Z stones are dug, right? So let's just do a little bit of a translation on that, right? So basically the blue stones were moved out into other holes and they were moved back in when the, uh, when the blue stones were actually re needed again. Anyway, that, that, that's something else. Um, so there we go. So, so here we go. Stone Stonehenge period one began as a causeway, a, cir a causeway circular ditch, uh, which was 115 meters in diameter, with an internal bank and a ditch on the outside. It was broken on the northeastern side by a single entrance. Right. So, um, so there we go. Uh, well, well, there, there, there's the uh, there's the, it, it, it's, it should be all rotated the other way around. And some 20 metres outside this, this, outside this stood the heel stone, which they reckon there might be two. A 25 ton block of unshaped sarsen stone. And then, if we, if we get rid of that, uh, inside the bank, a ring of Fifty-six pits caused the Aubrey holes were dug and almost at once refilled. These holes, right? When it says almost at once refilled, is this after like five years, ten years? Is that almost at once? Difficult to say. They may have held wooden posts for a brief period. So how long did they hold the posts? They may, and it is also possible that a timber setting stood at the center of the site, but it, it did almost all trace has been destroyed by later disturbance, right? Was there a, 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 a wooden hedge, a, a wooden circle in the middle, which would, would make it a wood hedge because of the wood hedge with the hedge on, on the outside? Um, 
So Stone Edge one probably involved about eleven thousand man hours of work. Uh, I, I would probably go with that to be honest. For once, how many? Um, um, that could be eleven thousand man hour, hours, Andy, over five years. It could have been a year. It could have been a month. Who knows? The approximate date for all this is around. Uh, it could be four thousand eight hundred years ago, or. 5,000 years ago. I actually believe it was earlier. Some 500 years later, 500 years later, how long is that? 500 years, that's a long time. That's, that's, that's about 13 generations, 40 or more. Uh, some 500 years later, at least 25 cremations were inserted into the filling of the Aubrey holes, which must still have been visible. So in other words, the, the, the holes were filled in, the, right, the, the holes dug, posts were placed in there, the posts rotted or were taken away, um, the, the, the holes were actually filled, and then 500 years later, people put cremations and bits of human remains in these Aubrey holes, right? So, are we with it? Right. So this, this initial stage of this site lasted 500 years or more. Next. I told you it's going to be fascinating. Next, this. There might be two heel stones, right? There's one there. But when they, when this book, bit of the book was written and when this was explained by Atkinson, there, there was only one heel stone. But anyway, period two. Well, now we know this too. Period two of Stonehenge saw the entrance slightly realigned, obviously northeast, so that from the centre, it faced approximately towards mid-summer sunrise and in the opposite direction to midwinter sunset. So in sun sites, we get midwinter sunset being revealed. At this site, this is midwinter sunrise. Midsummer sunrise, sorry. Midsummer sunrise at this site. Other sites are midwinter sunset, which is like the Arbolo site and a few other sites that we talked about. Uh, and also, did we did we do my towel on that one anyway? Carry on. Uh, an avenue of two parallel banks with external ditches was laid out for about 530 uh, meters towards Stonehenge bottom, right? So basically, there, there's 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 an alignment, which is half a kilometer long, of this thing here, which which is which is a which is, hang on, oh hang on a bit, lost all my bloody images now. Go away, go away. Hang on there. Uh, right there we go. This this thing here is the avenue, right? So it stretches all the way um, sort of northeast for um, over 500 metres uh, to a place known as Stonehenge Bottom. Four small stones, right? Okay, four small stones, which are the, these ones, right? Four small stones, right? Hang on a minute, stop there. Um, four small stones are these, right? Uh, these are known as the station stones were set up on the inner edge of the ditch. Two of them enclosed by small ditches of their own, right? Which is that one and that one, right? Why that is. And it, it reminds me, if you're a Catholic, the four stations of the cross, right? Which has nothing to do with this, but it, it, rings, it rings an edge there. And, right, carry on. And it says... At this stage, it was decided to erect a double circle of stones in the center, right? So there they are, right? Double circle of stones in the center. But, there, but there's some people arguing that whether that was a complete circle or not. That's the point, right? We'll never know because all that stuff in the middle has been disturbed. The material chosen with spotted dolerite, commonly known as bluestone of Welsh origin. Well, okay, I did the glacial thing, and we did electromat, and we proved how that was possible. Other archaeologists say it was brought over land or brought by water over a period of 500 years. Let's just move on. Uh, let's just not do that. We, 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 we might do that next week. We might not. Right. About three quarters of the circle was set up. A change of plan brought the work to a sudden halt. Or maybe it was completed. Maybe it wasn't. Right. And and the other thing as well is, did they complete one circle? Right. They run out of stones and then they decided to build 
you know, all these, this, Andy was, Andy put that earlier on in the right place. The stones were cleared away and the holes refilled. And this took place around 2045 years BC at the beginning of the Bronze Age. Well, well, um, yeah, roughly we're into the Bronze Age, but yeah, so now it's a Bronze Age monument. It really started to be a Bronze Age monument. Some believe that that happened before then. It has estimated that all of this, right, it took 360,000 360, man hours to construct, right? Now, that was probably over a long period of time. Now, the point the point is with all of this we've we've already right we we we've we've already been at Stonehenge for at least 400 500 years right uh, and right we we've you know the, the time might be a lot longer it might be shorter it might be a lot longer anyway so this this is a, a, and the uh, right and the other thing as well is right the other thing as well is when 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 these when these stones um were moved right hang on a minute stop stop when these stones were moved um they may have been placed in these holes around the outside right and then when they were wanted again oh they were put in the middle but that's another phase right so let's do period 3 a Almost at once, great sarsen stones were dragged at the site from the Marlborough Downs and set in an outer ring of 30 uprights. There they are, right? Within, with, in, uh, with inside it a horseshoe of five trilithons, literally three stones, all crowned with sarsen lintels. Well, can we just work something out here, right? The stones in the middle would have been put there first before... I know this sounds too obvious, right? But it's not as obvious. That reads as if the outer stone was put first and then the inner stones were placed. That's not true. The inner stones would have had to have been placed there because they're bigger, more cumbersome, and you wouldn't have been able to fit them in there, right? So they were they were then next, right? So so what what we've got, if we if we look there now, that's the that's the outside stones there. Those are the outside stones. And this this is an image actually taken by Atkinson, um, carefully shaped lintels of the outer ring of sarsen stones, a stonehenge. And these, uh, and obviously those little ones there are, are the uh, blue stones. And the big one there, that massive one there, is actually one of the trilithon stones, right? So if we go back to here, if we go back to here, uh, it said, um, so if we look at this, almost, um, so we've got the sarsen stones, Two four of the stones were erected at the entrance to the avenue. So there we go. Why? Uh, the slaughter stone, though fallen, still survives. An estimate of, uh, here we go, precisely 1,750,000 and one man hours were used in the construction phase of this. But this could be an exaggeration. So, and then, finally, we go on to the final phase. Right, we go on to the final phase, which is this. So this is the final phase. This is approximately about 3,540 years ago, or, or 1,540 years BC, whatever. An oval of blue stones was arranged inside the uh, in, inside the five trilithon stones in the middle. So there they are. There's the blue stones. If we have, there they are. Uh, the, the blue stones, this sort of horseshoe shape, they're arranged in there. there. There you go. Those, those, those are the blue stones, right? So, so they're arranged, right? Uh, those, those little ones, the smaller ones, not the big ones, the smaller ones. They're, they're, they're arranged there. The, these ones. Hang on a bit. Um, hang on a bit. Get rid of that. The, these, these ones. Yeah, the, these ones. These are the blue stones, right? The, these little blue ones are all over the place, actually, right? So th those are the blue stones, right? So th those those blue stones are placed there, right? So if we go back with, I won't stop, right? If we go back to there, this final image, and uh, uh, it said, um, it also said that the the 
It's also said that the holes on the outside, which are, which are called Y holes and Z holes. Hang on a bit. There we go. That there, that's actually the right orientation, right? So those so those holes there, there, right, is said um, were either there to hold the blue stones when they were moved in the earlier phases, or there may have been other blue stones placed in there anyway. However, this project was abandoned and the blue stones were rearranged in the horseshoe shape, as we see. One final event was the extension of the avenue from Stonehenge Bottom to the River Avon at West Amesbury, making its entire length of 1.5 miles in length. And this believed to have happened in um, over 3,000 years ago. So there are many remarkable things which we'll go on to next week about Stonehenge, not least the source of the blue stones. For 60 years, it was believed that they had been dragged 320 kilometres, 200 miles to the Stonehenge from the Preseli Mountains. This was based on a petrological examination made by a Dr Thomas in 1923, which showed that most of the rocks of which the blue stones are composed are spotted dollar, right? So if we um, go with those little ones there, that, that's the spotted dollar, right? Right, those little ones. Um, the spotted dollar, right, right, rhyolite and volcanic tufts. Um, occurred in Pine Mine in West Wales. In 1971, somebody by the name of Callaway suggested that the source was correct, but that the stones had reached Salisbury Plain by the movement of glacials or ice age sheets during the ice age. That's what I'm reading here, right? And now that's being dismissed, but I still go with that. Recent discoveries show that the great uh, Irish sea glacier would have crossed Pembrokeshire on its way eastwards plucking up and redistributing erratic boulders along its course. Evidence for its presence has been clearly found in the Mendip Hills, only 45 kilometres west of Stonehenge. Right. So what I might do, right, um, is we'll, we'll, um, I could have done, I Okay, okay, we'll, we'll mention this. Another expert in 1982 showed that at least some of the blue stones made of um, the Priscelli type um, could have actually come from Snowdon, which is in, in um, North Wales, which I think has now been dismissed. Um, from the many chippings of blue stones in the Stonehenge area, it's clear that they were not shaped until they reached the site. I'm not exactly sure about that. Um, it's a lot of weight. Yeah, anyway, and, and rough stones movement are going to be difficult. I would have shaped them in locality, which is some of the evidence. I don't know. Um, it would seem odd that the stones with all this excessive weight and awkward shapes should have been dragged all this way from Wales. If, if however, ice movement had brought them from Priscelli or Snowdon, which is the Snowdon bit, forget that, to somewhere on the western side of Salisbury Plain, then such action would be less surprising. If they were glacial, then they could be shaped in situ. If they had actually been moved from West Wales, they would have been done in West Wales by the humans who were going to move them, which is one thing that I dismiss. The glacial theory would also help to explain how one block of bluestone got into the bowls barrow, which I mentioned at Hatesbury, which predated Stonehenge by at least 500 years. And that, that is the point. A convenient glacial deposit of at least 60 stones, each weighing between six to seven tons, could have been moved with levers onto land sledges. Experiments have shown that this could have been achieved over flat, grassy ground, using a strength of about 32 men. I would say a lot less than that from, from my experience. Obviously, this was a perfect landscape to move stone because large chunks of it was relatively flat. Alternately, using rollers, and, and the number might be reduced to 14 haulers, though others would need to return the ro rollers. So you, you, it's it's loads of different ways of actually looking at that. So if you if you look at this image, we, we're, we're nearly done, folks, by the way, for this week. If we go back to that reconstructed image. Um, other large scale stone movements were required for the much bigger sarsen stones from the Marlborough Downs, as we know, Savanac Forest. Um, um, actually, Marlborough Downs is a bit further 
further northeast. But if they do come from Scavac, it's only 15 miles away. Lots of these stones weigh 50 tons plus. Um, again, experiments suggest that between 100 and 150 people would be needed to hold them, depending on the steepness of the ground. I, I, I can't go with that anymore. I don't go with that theory at all. I just don't. Uh, in fact, if you're going to move these stones, you need to have the minimum amount of individuals in, in total. It seemed likely that the blue stones did not come immediately to Stonehenge, but may have been first set up somewhere else. That's one theory. This could have have been near the near Stonehenge um, associated with the Cursus monument. Um, certainly all the heel stones at Stonehenge with the exception um, well lots of the lots of the heel stone look except it's going to be um, lots of the I'll start again lot, lots of the um, lots of the other stones which, which are on the site you know the, these these ones here these hang on a minute where the bloody hell are they right the, these ones on the outside are the main thing. They look like they, they've been, uh, they, they look really well made, but really not roughly hewn, really well hewn. But, but apparently the heel stone isn't, the two heel stones are not. Uh, all the upright stars and stones were smoothed into rectangular blocks using balls of stone uh, stones as hammers. Um, and again, um, again, looking at how well made this is, each upright um it says that it looks it looks like it sort of bulbous is out in the middle as, as it sort of goes up that is a sophisticated device used by architects to counteract the effects of perspective apparently all the lintel stones have groove and tongue joints these ones here on the outside tongue and tongue and groove and if we look there there is tongue and groove on the outside the one at the top um and the ones in the middle are mortis, mortis and tenon joints because there's three uprights you only need one mortis and tenon for the capstone this suggests that the builders were copying the work of carpenters with which they were more familiar uh, these remarkable architectural refinements are not found on any other contemporary monuments in western europe that makes the site unique and before we finish a number of stones carry carvings of metal axes and one has a hilted dagger some of these things they've been um, surveying recently and actually sort of understanding them a bit more um, and obviously there's 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 mason's marks and some graffiti left over the years however serious consideration should be given to them as symbols of an axe cult surviving from early neolithic times stone axes as we know coming from um, 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 Cumbria coming from West Wales Flandergai in Gwynedd and so on um, and this, what we're going to do now, we're going to we're going to call that a day. Um, we could talk about the, the sunrise and and sunsets again, which I'm sure we'll be doing more of next week. But on that moment, we're going to call it a day. Um, thank you for joining us today, and we're going to see if there are any questions. And I think Pat just left us. Did she? It looked like, although I thought she'd already gone. All right. Okay. Came back briefly. Oh, right. She came back briefly. I think mm. she wanted to see you, Andy. Because ah. <laughs> I wasn't even on. All right. Uh, David, anything you want to say this week? No, thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. Anne, anything from you? No, I, I thought it was all very interesting, all the uh, various pieces that sort of don't really link, but they're very interesting that they've all been recently found. Okay. And, uh, did, did David say good night all? He might have done, yeah. Yes, I done. God, never mind. Anyway, uh, what, go on, carry on, Anne. Uh, that's all I think to say, really. I found it really interesting. Mind you, I've been kind of, I, I, I somehow seem to get very tired in the evenings and struggle to keep attention very well but i've a nice list to it thank you you need a bit of honey you need a bit of honey that's all you need yeah i need right <laughs> bit of honey right okay Gina. no no and I, I like looking at all the different pictures it's a lot easier to understand yeah when you get those yeah yeah yeah, yeah it, is, it is it is sites and things yeah 
but very, very much so, very much so. Uh, thank you very much, Drina. And finally, Andy. Yeah, no, no, it's interesting. Um, like I said, Stonehenge is always interesting, isn't it? There's always, there's always something more to look at and think yeah, about with yeah. Stonehenge. It's yeah. good, isn't it? Yeah. That's the one advantage of there being a lot of a lot of work there. There's always something more to question. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So we'll 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 have a, a, a more of a a look next week at some of the more intricate things. So that's what we're going to be doing next week. I'm just going to check on my list that I've covered everything. And um, did I, yeah, did I going... hear you right saying that that the oh, the, the stone eight this uh, this. Uh, the Stonehenge Archer is not the Avery Archer. It's a different one. Yeah, the Stonehenge Archer is 1978. The Amesbury is 2002. I didn't, I didn't realise it was a separate one. I always assumed it was the same one. So those yeah. the two archers. We've got two. It, it, it's mm. a do, 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 Interesting. Do, 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 do. Yeah, yeah it's not archers. very far apart either, are they? It's funny that they find two there and not, well, so far not found any anywhere else. Two separate archers, the Stonehenge archers. Mm. The Avery archer had a bit of gold, but I don't know. Uh, yeah, we'll have to look at this. Um, Ooh, yeah, potential metal worker, eh? Whew. Yeah, shut up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, actually, actually what, what we what we could do is a bit of detail. We we, we could uh, we we could compare the difference between those two next week, the Stonehenge uh, archer uh, versus the Amesbury archer. Are there any other archers found? There are other, not that I know of. <laughs> There's David Archer uh, oh, yeah. and his wife. <laughs> Just about as old, yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Flip an egg. I, I occasionally catch it occasionally. And, and you know what? If you can you can just uh, it's the same people uh, and, and it's almost as if uh uh you can just catch up. It's great. Yep. As That's long what... as David Archer's in it, you're fine. If, 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 if it's the end of the world if he goes I, I wouldn't know where I will and the Grandies yes <laughs> don't, don't go there don't go there right. Listen, Any, can go I just on. say something it's probably going to be stupid the golden talk that you showed us at the beginning was found in the Iron Age and yeah. I just, just I couldn't get my head around that it should be I don't, uh -huh. I don't, not a gold age, but you know, yeah. it's just oh god, we we done this. We had a lead age. No, we yeah, we we <laughs> we've already had this conversation. It just doesn't go anywhere. It's really that's uh, all right. I didn't expect it to. It's just, uh -huh. just so found... gold doesn't count. It's always there. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a bit like you, Andy. You're, you're always there as well. <laughs> I was interested in that. I was looking at when because those drawings were broken down, so you just got the kind of the the, the circles of the ditches and all the rest. And I thought, oh, don't they look like talks? <laughs> oh <laughs> my god, no! <laughs> With the gap where the um they get mm. in, yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Probably oh, yeah. no connection whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, talk. Yeah, or, or even Avery, where you've got four four bits, and it's like four individual bits of the talk. They don't really go yeah, around the next one. Just more than that. <laughs> don't, don't take a genius to work out that one ain't going to work, does it? But no, that's not going to work. <laughs> bit of elastic <laughs> between. Oh. Yeah. What about the 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 stones in Stonehenge going around in a circle? That could rep the talk could represent that, could it? Yeah, it could. Well, the ones in the middle, maybe it does. Yeah. Or, or, or maybe, what they, maybe what they did at um, uh, Avery, where you've got a, a square, a square circle, haven't you? That was like a square talk, <laughs> but it just didn't work. Oh, well, there's always got to be one, hasn't there? You know, yeah. Oh, yeah. we're not having a circle. We're having a square. <laughs> we're having a square talk circle. <laughs> yeah. Right, when's a circle not a circle when it's square? Exactly. That's job done. Yeah. <laughs> oh. uh, Square yes. Squares that look round, eh? Yeah. Hang on a minute. I've got something that's come online a minute, right? I, I'm going to read this out. Three of the remains from the Aubrey Halls were from the West Country. Ooh. Hang on a minute. It says, no, it said, no. And then it goes, probably Pembroke. Oh, with a little badge saying, we brought the stones. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, that's really interesting. That's I, I, that is interesting. I didn't know that either. Well, I don't, that, yeah. 
yeah. That, that cool. kind of analysis is only starting to happen now, though, isn't it? So, which is great. Yeah. So, yeah. But that doesn't mean anything either. It didn't mean to say that. Th How could three of them bring those big stones? <laughs> may, may, maybe they haven't found the fourth one. Ah, and, and uh, uh, he went back. Yeah. It was obviously four, yeah. And Andy, and, and Andy, are you assuming they're all men, or they could have just been women? Yeah, I could be either strongest um, person. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or they could be hermaphrodites or, or transgender. We've got to be very careful with these, Andy. Yes, <laughs> they, that even that's getting into the arches now. I heard, what, it, what, I heard it the other day, and there was a very mixed up relationship between three of them. I thought, oh my what's God, going I'm... on? This is the <laughs> archers. What's happening? Yeah. And I thought, oh, yeah. I know what they're doing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Did, did, didn't we have a phase on bloody um, on uh, Emmerdale Farm where there was like four transgender relationships going on in, in a village of like five people? And I just yeah. think, yeah, I don't get this. <laughs> yes, this is local store for local people. Yes. <laughs> Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah, they wouldn't have I'm the only gay. <laughs> they wouldn't have that on a League of Gentlemen. Oh, my no. God. What was it? What was his name, wasn't it? They did the, uh, I'm the only gay in the village. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I'm the only gay in the village. Oh, yeah. Um, what was his oh, name? Not Rodri. Oh, yeah, fat lad. Yeah, I know. Uh, fat lad. Yeah, really funny guy. Oh, uh, God. Matt it Lucas. Is, Matt Lucas, yeah. yeah, and he played it so well and for so long until he found out there were a few others and then his face just dropped. <laughs> <laughs> he had to find out one day, I suppose. Didn't he? he did. He Good did. series, did. that. It was brilliant. It was, it was. It wouldn't get away with her now. No, yeah. probably not. No. no. Definitely not. Flipper, eh? And yet that led the way and opened up the, the, uh, the door, didn't it? So. Oh, yeah, totally. Totally, it did. It did. It did. Right, um, it's now 10.14, so anything else? Want to say anything? No, that's great, thanks. Thank you. Could you imagine if the rest of them would have been you, we'd be still here at 12. Yeah, well, they, they do go on, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Margaret, they do go on. Yeah, you said it. I'm not, I don't even mention that next week, so get upset. Oh, I can't. <laughs> you can't upset Margaret. <laughs> no. Jolly good. On that note, any, anyway, thanks everybody. I'm going to call it a uh, night. So uh, many thanks, Andy, every, anybody online, and uh, Drina and Anne. And we'll see you all next Tuesday. Hopefully, we'll, we'll be we'll be back at strength. Maybe, hopefully. Yep. Great. Yeah. Okay. Bye all. Thank okay. you. Bye, Bye. Andy, Good night. Drina, and no, 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 folks. No, 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 Anne. Right. That's everybody. Uh, back, Black Patches dog. Thanks for that information. If anyone ever wants to join these classes, actually take part like this. Fun. Actually, you've just got me, guys. So if you want to chat to me, I've actually caused a real stink today on TikTok. I've um I put a bit I put a video up about Tony Blair um being put on trial for war crimes in Iraq against um, UNESCO World Heritage Sites. And everybody, every comment that I've had on TikTok has, um, has agreed with me, which is really weird. So I, I, I want to put I want to put something on here a minute. Hang on a minute. And I just want to just want to find something a minute. Um, I don't know where it is. Where is it? I'm going to put something in here in a minute, guys. Anyone want to say anything? Well, well, whilst whilst you still got me here. Oh, by the way, we're on Sunday YouTube. We're on on Sunday. And if any of you guys want to um, join my my chit chat on Zoom, just just let me know. If not, um, thank you very much. I'm going to see. I'm going to be. Oh, yeah, I'm on tomorrow as well. Oh, God. Yeah, I'm doing this tomorrow, but um, there'll be a couple of things ironed out tomorrow. So it'll be tomorrow at 7.30-ish. And we're not doing tomorrow morning. And if there's nothing anybody else wants to say, then keep following, keep supporting. And, uh, yes, I might be going over to Rumble as well. But I haven't, I haven't been... Um, 
prescribed by YouTube yet, but they're coming after all of us by the looks of it. Right. OK, so oh, what was I going to say? I'll go look at the chat box a minute. Anyone wants to say anything can. If not, good night, everybody. So uh, so here we go. Close meeting. And oh, I'm going to write good night. Good night, folks. Um, Amar or Hid. Amar or Hid. So I'm going to look in the chat box. Uh, there's nothing. Hang on. Oh, here we go. I hope I got anything in the chat box. Is there anything on the chat box on one, two, and press that button, three, on that window, four, on that window, five. Nothing in the chat box. New didn't have any notification either. Why aren't people getting, I had the same thing on one, on Saturday. Oh, um, Right. Guys, have you got the note? Have you got the bell? Have you got the notification bell on your phone? Um, so you know to do that anyway. If you got the notification bell, it should it should have come up. Right, so if you do the notification bell, it'll work for tomorrow and um On Sunday, yeah. So do that, and you get it. But I get notifications without the notification bell. I know it's my own channel, but well, I'm, I haven't said it once. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And um, after I finish eating this. So Black Patch's dog didn't have right. Okay, oh, Black Patch's dog. Right, let me get this right. Have you have you pressed the? Have you got the bell pressed? Right. Have you got the bell pressed alongside my my profile? Right. There should be a bell. And and it yeah. Have you got that pressed? That's all I'm asking. You probably have. But if you haven't, you need to press that. And then you get a notification. And it's the same with um, our friend M. It's the same with our friend uh, Mr. Wood as well. Or Mr. Tree. Or Forrest. You could be Mr. Forrest, couldn't you? As in Forrest Gump. A good guy. Yeah, so. So tell you what, right, I'm on it. I'm on at seven. Oh. You always get the notifications. Do you know what? Right, I, I, I've, I've got a funny feeling about this. Hmm. Yeah, I'm just gonna have a quick look a minute. See if there's anything my end. Um, uh, they have changed stuff. Oh bollocks! They have changed stuff around. Pay payroll and payments platform. Right. Okay. Right. History, fact of the data, it's your recent content. And that recent content has been, yeah. Right, okay, 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 right, yes. Well, I've, um, I've been sort of warned about that. So I'm going on to more inflammatory content about putting, um, I'm going after people. So yeah. Well, the thing is, if you don't put if you don't put this this new content out there, I I know I've got my my fact that my my question of the day, which it seems to be doing extremely well. 
I've I've in in the past 24 hours in the past 48 other hours I've had 6000 views. <clears throat> and they seem to just be about one thing mainly. Anyway guys, yes we we we'll, we'll see about that. Anyway, I got to call it a day. I I got to dash. I got to I got to crack on with some other stuff and I will see you tomorrow. I'll be on tomorrow 7:30. Mr. Wood, Black Patch's dog, Patch in a pear tree, the Pope and Gandalf the Brave. Um, um, one, two, three, close on one. And uh, thanks for your support. Continued. Really appreciate your support. Always, always. Don't take it for granted. Uh, I'm gonna look at this. Close one, close two, close three. Okay, okay. night, no, no, folks. Yochum Barachi and Golochi, Golochieto, Golochi, Avari Nau Riam. Dioch. Okay, no, no, Dioch Barachi. Night, 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 night. Yeah, um, unfortunately, um, unfortunately, you might be able to say what you like. They're they're starting to reduce my monetization on here already. Um, I don't get a lot from YouTube. I get a little bit, but my monetization is actually they they're even though things are supposed to be monetized, some of the things they're demonetizing by the looks of it, and also they uh, yeah, it's not a free country, is it? And I'm not even supposed to be saying that. Right. I tell you what, we'll catch up on Sunday about this stuff online. And I might have to do some stuff on Rumble as well, where you're allowed to say more things. OK. Anyway, thanks for your support. I'm dashing now. Good night. And I'll, I'll, I'm going to keep saying good night all night. I'm going to say good night. Good night now. Go. Night night. Night night. Thank you. Bye.